Often what makes uh, someone a good pastor also works against them being a, a good planner. Really? Right? Yeah. Well, because what happens is you're so attuned to people. You know, you're dialed in to, to the congregation and really kind of where they are and how to how to teach to, you know, what's going on in their life, how to apply the truth of God's word. Sometimes you, you can mm. take a step back and look beyond just kind of the next conversation. That's or the next fascinating. Moment. I'm just excited about today's episode because we're talking about vision, which is one of the most important things in the life of any leader or any church. Describe what you mean by vision. So vision is a picture of a preferred future. Like it's 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 the place you want to go. You want to lead your people. And we have Brian Rose on the show today who worked with Auxano, the arm of Lifeway that helps churches redo their vision framing. And I mean this in a very encouraging way. All of us come to a point in life where we just don't know what to do. We don't have any vision. And pastors reach that point. We're like, okay, we just finished this great season. What do we do now? Yeah. And there's moments where we need help forming a new vision. And Brian talks about it today in such a great and encouraging way for any leader or any church to start thinking about. And the reason that this uh, episode really happened is we saw an Instagram post. Right. And do you remember what it said? Yeah. I mean, he just talked about um, how to escape the week to week thinking. Yes. And which is so common in churches. And so... It's so common in life. I mean, even at home. I mean, you and I sometimes are like, okay, who's taking who where this week? And so you want to have this great grand vision, but it's hard to do that. I think in church life, especially since Sunday is always coming, you just tend to think week to week Mm -hmm. and you don't have any long-term vision, but who's got time for that? Ain't nobody got time for that, Mm -hmm. right? So I think what Brian does today (laughs) is he really lays out some, some steps and some principles and some ideas for that pastor and pastor's wife, they're maybe they're sitting out there like, I don't know if we're still here two years from now. I don't, do we still have a vision for this place? He encourages you to think about vision in a new way. I also liked that he began this conversation. We we were talking about how do you know if you don't have vision? I mean, that's a really helpful way because I, I would bet, um, and every pastor's wife may amen me and every pastor is going to roll their eyes, that every pastor thinks they have vision. And, you know, somebody some somewhere, sometimes it falls on the pastor's wives, has to say, I think you need some help in this area. Well, everybody wants to be visionary, and every pastor feels like if there is no vision, the people should perish. They're going to perish, so I've got to have a vision. Mm-hmm. But if they're really honest, they're thinking mostly about the sermon for next Sunday and maybe mm-hmm. some people in the hospital they need to go and see. Well, I mean, they're so busy. I mean, there's funerals, there's birth, there's all kinds of things, and so— and what I love about what Oxano does is they come alongside that busy pastor and say, let us help you with that, because most pastors do need some help with it. So excited to get this conversation rolling today. Brian, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah, we're excited to talk about this. Yeah. And really, we want you to define vision as like just as the kickoff beginning of this podcast. Yeah, that's that's an easy question, right? Define vision. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, well, we, in, know, 30 yeah, in 30 seconds. In 30 seconds. I don't know that I can do anything in 30 seconds, but I'll, I'll start to define vision. You know, vision is, for us, illustrating and anticipating God's better future. Okay. And so, really, what is that picture of God's better future? You might think of it like a travel brochure. Uh, many times we have uh, interpretations or see culture like, well, vision and mission are synonymous. But we'd say, no, mission is how you get somewhere. Like, what are you going to do? Like that compass heading. But vision, in its purest form, is a travel brochure. It's painting a picture. I think about the children of Israel standing at the at the edge of the Jordan River. You know, God didn't say, hey, remember we were here before and you were disobedient, now go do what I said because I said so and I'm God. He painted a picture. He gave them, you know, language like a land flowing with milk and honey. Talked about mountains filled with iron and where you can dig copper out of the hills. He painted a picture of a better future. Why? Well, you know, he could have done like I do when I parent and just say, well, I said so. But really, he knew that they're going to be moved at most by understanding, hey, here's a picture of where we are. Yeah. So for pastors and leaders, being able to paint that picture and say, hey, listen, man, as best we can see it right now, this is how we see God forming and shaping our church over the next few years. And this is what we're going to do to get there. Lindley and I have the joy of dropping in on a lot of churches with yeah. my this job. And 
uh, we often chuckle how similar the mission statements yeah, of churches yeah, are. Yeah. Love God, love yeah. people, serve the world. Yeah. I'm like, Almost every yeah. time. I'm like, which is, I know that's the mission. I mean, yeah. that is the, the statement. But. It's the great commandment and the great commission. However, yeah. how does this church fulfill that mission statement with yeah. the vision that God's yeah. given them? That's where a church yeah. really finds its personality. Yeah. Well, we like to laugh and say, well, it's like going into a restaurant and they say, hey, you know, here's our big vision. We serve food. Yeah. <laughs> Like, what? Well, we got that. You're a restaurant. Like, what kind of food? And you're like, oh, good food. Food that doesn't make you sick. Like, no, no, what is it that you guys do? And so part of the, part of the work we do in, in helping uh, bring, you know, vision or maybe even restore or maybe just, you know, re, re, reconnect with it. Because yeah. I, I would venture to say very few leaders lead without vision at all. And Oxano goes alongside churches and helps them form a new frame, a new vision frame, so they can see a preferred future and get their people rallied around it. You guys even did that with us when I first came on as president, helping us kind of rethink the future and doing so with objective tools. So one of the things Lindley and I wanted to ask you was just, first of all, is how does a pastor or pastor's wife out there listening, how can they diagnose whether they're really, they have a vision? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there is, um, you know, an understanding whether we have a vision or not. Sometimes that's just a sense, you know. Uh, sometimes you can look at patterns, habits. You can look at some things that are going on. Um, you know, I, I think everybody operates. I mean, we get out of bed and we go to our office. There's some form of vision that gets us there. Often it's though it's a vision we held on to 10 or 15 years ago or maybe when we first took the role on. And that's, I think, what weighs down sometimes is we know that we're not thinking about the future in terms of vision. It's really kind of a picture of where or maybe it's a picture of the future we had a few years ago. And times have changed. You know, COVID reset the deck. There's all kinds of things. Culture has changed. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things going on around us. And so a lot of times it's not that we lack vision. It's like we lack a a vision of God's better future. You know, our vision is just survival. Our vision is, um, you know, what's next. How does a leader know if they are lacking vision? Great question. I think the classic definition of insanity kind of plays in here. Yeah. Yep. Doing the same thing, but expecting different results. And I kind of playfully like to say there's a type A church insanity doing what someone else is doing and expecting their results. Hmm. Right. So if you find yourself kind of grabbing from models without, and listen, it's important to learn, right? It's important to learn, but to apply in context. And so if you're just kind of chasing after the next big thing you saw, the next idea, that's one thing. Um, I think type B church insanity is doing what we've always done just with a new logo or, <laughs> or a new name for a program <laughs> and expecting different results. Yeah. So if, if you find yourself in that cycle of just rebranding or reskinning let's something, rename it. yeah, let's rename it. And it's all going to be different. We're not going to call it Sunday school anymore. We're going to call life, it life groups. groups, right? And it's all <laughs> different, right? And it's like, you know, if you find yourself in that cycle, that churn, or you're in a churn of like longing nostalgically, like remember when we did this? Remember when 20 years ago there wasn't much else to do culturally but go to church 30 years ago? You know, then you might be in that visionless, a vision vacuum there. Um, there's also other things, you know, we could talk uh, more in depth about, you know, um, there's counterfeits of, of vision clarity, right? Mm-hmm. There's, you know, you try to be hyper creative and I've seen that, right? I've mm-hmm. seen that pastor who was like, well, I don't have vision, but I'm just going to be creative. So every Sunday has to be more creative than the last. Now, creativity yeah. in the church is like a gremlin. Remember the movie Gremlins? Mm-hmm. You know, you start to feed it and it just, you know, starts <laughs> to overtake everything. It has to be bigger and bigger. Uh, ambiguity, sometimes all things to all people, you know, you start to see some patterns emerge there. This is one of my favorite parts of the episode. I love what he says here. Uh, Type A and type B churches. The type A church is trying to do what everybody else is doing and expecting to get the same results, even though they're in a different context. The type B church is just slapping a new logo on what they're already doing. And both of those are a temptation. When we were getting ready to plant a church, I remember the day where you were like, you've got to stop asking other pastors how to plant oh. a church because you're you're making this patch quilt that's going to be really awkward. I forgot about that. Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah. So we were preparing for to move to Denver. We were living in Orlando. We were there for about five or six months, and Ben spent probably every day with a different person asking what they should do, what he should do for the church. And finally, it was late April. We were moving back to Denver in May, and I said, I need you to stop. Yep. Like you keep using this guise of um, seek counsel. So there's only so much counsel you can seek before you just have to have the vision yourself. 
Like we are planning storyline. It's our church. What what is the DNA that that you feel like God right. is leading and, you to? And what I thought was humility at the time, I now look back and see it was anxiety. Mm. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to plan a church. So I was asking everybody and their brother, how would you do it? And over time, I was becoming more and more confused. Perhaps I should have called Oxano also. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm just saying there are moments where a pastor doesn't know what to do. We ask everybody else, but we really don't have a vision. I think maybe that's where it starts to say, I, I'm struggling with the vision. But then there's the second part he talked about how it just, let's just keep doing the same thing, but rename it or mm-hmm. slap a new skin on it. Yeah. And I've done that before. We've all done that before. And I think it's funny too. There's a pattern of people at like First Baptist Churches changing their names, you know, to be like Main Street Church or something. Which is cool, but that's not necessarily going to like... Bring them in. Well, it's effective, too, because, I mean, you know, it, it does change the context and it's a, a more up-to-date church. But if you don't change some of the things inside, then you're just slapping a new logo. Yes, and it's easy to do. Now, let's talk about the counterfeits. These two are very interesting. One is hyper-creativity. You know, there's always that pastor out there that's like, I'm launching a series on spiritual warfare and we're going to bring a tank on stage. And then next week, we're going to bring camels in for the Christmas story. I mean, we're always trying to figure out as pastors, like new creative elements and thinking that's vision, but that's actually not vision. That's just a creative idea. Mm. Vision is showing people where you're going. So they have comfort of knowing, okay, we're on a journey. We're in this together. We're going to a preferred place. And he's been very clear about where we're headed. Mm. So I think it's easy to confuse creativity for vision. And then the ambiguity one may be one of my favorites. He didn't talk a lot about it, but just this idea that I don't have to have a vision as long as I just do what everybody else wants to do. So in a missions uh, uh, category, you could say, uh, we're just going to give all the people that want money for missions, we're just going to take the money we have in missions and spread it out evenly like among everybody. Mm -hmm. That feels like vision, but it's actually not vision at all because vision requires you to prioritize your resources. And it's going to make some people mad. Well, I mean, I just think of, is it like, is it the country song that says if you stand in the middle, you're going to get hit from both sides? Or, I mean. Uh, that has to be a country song. Well, there is one. <laughs> I think that's also a verse, but <laughs> I was meaning there is a country song. And I, it just is kind of like that, like at a point, and we've had to do that so many times of saying in a really kind way, when someone comes to you and wants something specific, you just have to say, there is a church down the street that's doing that really well. And you should visit that church. They would be blessed to have you. Not or rudely, just kindly. The line I started using, which seemed to work, is to say, we don't have a vision for that. Mm-hmm. We have a vision for these things. And to just simply be honest, because a vision, like stewardship biblically means the management of limited resources. So to be a visionary, you have to say, we have limited resources, and this is the direction we're going to point those resources. Mm-hmm. So to just say, we're going to spread it out evenly among everybody's interest is not vision. And so Brian's right to say that's ambiguity. But I think it depends on your context, too, because when we were at our church in Jackson, there was a university very close by. And so, like, there was a high priority on vision casting for college students. That was not the case in, at Storyline. And so it, you would have been silly to say, hey, this is where we're going to put all of our all of our vision into colleges at Storyline, because there was nothing nearby. It's knowing your context and not thinking that you can pull it off because some other church has that amazing ministry. You have a different context, a different group of people, and a different time. So you have to be sensitive to what God's calling you to do in your context. Some of my favorite episodes to record are the ones where where there's like a linear process. And Brian's going to lay out five steps that you can begin think through to get vision for your church. And Lindley, I thought, let's just talk about the first two and then he can jump into number three. But the first one is just spending time with the Lord. Vision comes from God. So you can't go to the church and say, hey, let's come up with a vision without first spending time alone with the Lord. And I I think honestly in the past, that's been something I've been tempted to shortcut. Sometimes I go straight to people and be like, hey, what are your ideas? Mm -hmm. Before I've I've really had time to ask the Lord, like, Lord, what do you want for this church? What do you want for us in this next season? Well, I think of Robbie Gallaty a little bit, the episode that with the Gallaties, he went through that season of spending hours at a time with the Lord because he just felt like he needed it in that moment to just understand where the Lord was calling their church. I knew I was burning out then. I knew I was getting to um, a season of, of just being exhausted, but I didn't know how exhausted I was. So I knew I needed to start slowing down 
And so unprepared for COVID, I decided to start spending silence and solitude time with the Lord. I had to learn early on, many times there's no tangible response from God. There's nothing like you, you, you don't really receive anything. You don't get anything downloaded from the Lord. And the Lord had to show me this is way more than you getting something from me. This is about you being with me. I just basically started to sit in silence, wasn't trying to get anything from God, just sitting in silence, started with 10 minutes, went to 20 minutes, went to an hour to two hours. You can ask Candy toward the middle uh, of the revival. I was spending two to three hours every night with the Lord in silence. And I tell people early on, I was, I, I was really blown away because I would sit out there and I remember about two months in, I, I told the Lord, I was coming in the house. I was an hour and a half about sitting with the Lord. I was coming in the house and I'm like, God, really? What was that? I felt like the Holy Spirit really kind of nudged me and say, Robbie, you didn't get nothing. You actually got everything because you got me and I got you. And it was at that moment I realized what, what silence and solitude was. And I, I tell people, so for those who are hearing this for the first time, you're probably like, what are you talking about? You got to remember God's first language was silence, right? I mean, what do you mean? He spoke everything out of silence. When Moses and Elijah are trying to determine the character of God, they ask him, who are you? Show us your glory. God puts him in the rock. You remember? And the, the wind comes by. He's not in the wind. He's not in the hurricane. He's not in the fire. He's in the still small voice. And I think about that passage in, in Acts where it says that, you know, the disciples had been with Jesus, even though they were ordinary, unschooled men, the people were amazed because they had been with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So hopefully if we're spiritual leaders, our people can sense that we've already bathed this in prayer. So spending time with God is important to to do like as you begin to sense a need for vision. I mean, we may cut this, but do you have any examples for you? I mean, you've led Inglewood, you've led Storyline, you've led Lifeway. Like, where have there been seasons where you've had to leave? I mean, you've talked about this a little bit. Step I mean, away. to well to just have time with the Lord. I mean, you you mentioned before on the podcast how for forty days before we took this job at Lifeway, like the Lord was waking you up. Yeah. And it was an intense season. There's those moments where you feel like you're in the crucible and you can sense that God really wants something from you. And you're like, Lord, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do here? And when I was in the season of praying about whether we'd come to Lifeway, it's just every morning, I mean, for hours, journaling and praying and thinking, uh, God, you just got to show me the way. And I, I do think we, we tend to sense that season is coming upon us when there's an intensity about us. We can sense Lord's new, he's doing a new thing or he wants to do a new thing. So like Jesus did, pulling away from the crowds to get time alone, I think is the first step. Mm -hmm. But then the next step also is just putting people around you that are good at vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I love coming up with ideas, but I am not great at structuring those ideas. No. <laughs> yeah, believe it or not. I didn't I know that. Every morning. I love coming up with the ideas. I love the ideation process, but the actual system of phasing it out, like here's what we're going to do in phase one, phase two, phase three. Well, it's I hard think, for me. I think there's system. I think there's also discernment. And I'm not saying that yeah. you don't have discernment. I'm saying, you know, when there is a, a net cast really wide for a vision, like, there has to be a group of people there praying together to say, is this our will? Or are we discerning the the call of God. And I think this is an important place to talk about putting high capacity women in the room. Uh, let's talk about yeah, let's high talk, capacity I women. About this no, I let's all. have rooms full of men. <laughs> I, what a great thing for a pastor to put a, a strategic team together of men and women who are great leaders to just think about what would the Lord call us to do next, involving both men and women leaders together informing that vision so it's not just men or it's not just older men like mm -hmm. various people in the church mm -hmm. uh, diversity of, of leaders so those are the first two things that brian talked about number one seeking time with the lord and number two getting people around you a team around you to help and now we're going to jump into the interview where he starts to lay out steps three four and five so let's jump in and hear what he has to say what would you say are the next steps in terms of like how do you begin to form a vision ask the right questions Get in a context or an environment, whether that's with a strategic outsider like Oxano or not, and just begin to ask the right questions. And what, what do we want to celebrate five years from now? What do we want to celebrate 10 years from now? Like what in our mind's eye as we gather as a church, if we continue to see God at work, 
or if we see some change that we're we're longing for, the first thing to do is like, wait, what do we want to celebrate? Mm-hmm. What do we want to really just, you know, and then start to work backwards from there. Man, we want to see, you know, 500 people um, come to know the Lord in the next 10 years. Like, okay, that's a, that's a beautiful vision. It's got a great scope. It's got time to it. Now you can start to go, well, what's going to have to happen in order to see that? Yeah. Right? I want to ask you what you think about that, because I just remember when we were on staff together at church, like, those questions are great, but we need 14 people yeah. for preschool this next Sunday, and we've got three. Like, do you feel, like, intimidated by those questions? No, I love those questions. I mean, I think even personally, we've done that with our family of, like, our family values yeah. of what do we want our family to be like when we release them? Yeah. And how do how are we going to get there? And so, I mean, I feel like it makes great sense to say, you know, this is the goal. Now, whether that's our personal goal, whether that's God's goal for this yeah. church, but this is what we hope right. to see. Right. And how do we work backwards in, you know, in an appropriate timeline? I mean, I think that's so... Like for me, that feels really comforting. Yeah, because I think it's stressful to live week to week. Yeah, what, what often what makes uh, someone a good pastor also works against them being a, a good planner. Really? Right? Yeah. Well, because what happens is you're so attuned to people. You know, you're dialed in to to the congregation and really kind of where they are and how to how to teach to you know what's going on in their life, how to apply the truth of God's word in the context of what's going on there, and, and so you're so attuned to the people that that. Sometimes you you can't take a step back and look beyond just kind of the next conversation That's or the next fascinating. moment. So and, like the best pastors are present. They're fully yeah. present with their people, but that presence may keep them from thinking about the future tense. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say the best pastors, but I would say, <laughs> you know, there is an uh, there is a, an aspect of leading people that requires you to be present, right? And in the moment and understanding what's going on. But sometimes we can be so in the moment that we're not thinking beyond. Also, some of us like that are also wired and do some of the best work when we're under pressure. And, you know, stress brings out like, you know, the energy and the drive and we, and we, we feel like we execute well, but that there's stress that that happens to our family and our staff, right? They, we, we thrive under the pressure. We love, you know, I heard Carrie Newhoff say, you know, having the message done by Tuesday. Like I know a lot of pastors who would laugh at that, right? They don't start till Thursday because, but there's something about that. Hey, listen, you know, I work better under pressure. I work better. But the ramification is, well, your family's stressed out Mm -hmm. because you're stressed out on Thursday night that you didn't get it all done in one day or Saturday morning, you're finishing up you know, or your team. I, I knew a pastor who would start his uh, sermon Sunday morning about 3 a.m. He'd wake up, spend time with the Lord, go to his office. Uh, I, I put air quotes up on spend time with the Lord because, you know, <laughs> the Lord may not be up at three o'clock in the morning if you've waited to work on your sermon. I'm just kidding. Yeah. You know that. Um, but he would then send like about an hour before service, send the notes over. Oh. And, it, and listen, he could preach the ticks off a dog. <laughs> Lindley, I just have to stop right here and say, that is the most Southern reference to preaching that I've ever heard. Okay. He could preach the ticks off a dog (laughs) on that kind of preparation. It would be great. It worked for him. It worked for him. Yeah, but here's what happens. That team who cringes because the words are misspelled on the screen, that want to take pride in the work they do, that want to feel confident about what we're doing here, they don't get that. They don't have that. And the reason to ask the right questions is so important is, Lindley, can you count the number of times we've heard someone say this about their pastor? He's a great pastor. He's not a great leader. Yeah. Or yeah. he loves yeah. the people. He goes yeah. to the hospital. He does a great funeral service. But, you know, his heart is pure, yeah. but he's not a good preacher. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the tension. You got these pastors that tend to lean towards planning, but they're not very present with people, or the opposite, they're very present with people, but nobody has a clue where they're going as a church. And so whichever one you lean towards, because probably every pastor leans toward one of those two, you need help. Yeah, you need a team, first of all, and a team may not necessarily be staff members, right? Don't hear me say team, and I'm going to automatically assume people who are paid um, you know, I think I think it's important to cultivate those leaders around you who can help, uh, who can you know fill in some gaps and be strong in some areas you're not, and and talk about that. You know, um, be transparent to say, hey, listen, I'm not real good in hospital rooms, but you are. Will you come with me? I'll do the prayer part because that's I always uh-huh. have to do that. You know, no matter where yeah. we are, family gatherings, everything. You know, pastor gets to pray, right? But 
if you will come and kind of bring some bedside manner to this, you know, because I can be kind of cold and detached or I can, you know, be very technical and say, well, you know, how are you doing? You know, kind of a thing. Um, I think what's even beautiful about that is in the scenario you're giving, there are people in every church who have suffered, who have lost people. And so to call on those people to say, can you come to the hospital with me and remember yeah. What meant a lot to you when you were there? It's a blessing, yeah. Um, because, like, for he and I, we've not lost parents, we've not lost children. I mean, so we don't have that understanding of right. pain that other people yeah. might have. So let's stay with the process here. So we got somebody who's <laughs> gotten away with the Lord. He has yeah. a vision. He gets uh, somebody to come alongside and help. He now has a team of people that are yeah. asking the right questions about where they want to be ten years from now. What happens next? You've got questions on the yeah. whiteboard, but what do yeah. you do? Well, then, then I think it's important to think. Um, think chronologically, even working backwards, as I suggested, to kind of go from, okay, this is where we see God leading us. Okay, what are the next 90 days? You know, what are the what are the three or four big things we need to do in the next 90 days? Um, how, how do we break this apart? If it's a five-year vision, you know, what what's important what's most important in the next year? Like what do we what do we need to work on for the next year and, and at a visionary level to see that take place, like to see this movement forward. Start breaking it down to manageable bits that are both visionary so that we can inspire people, but also strategic so that we can uh, align people to get some things done. And I think when you start to think in those rhythms, then it's it's not just, well, we've put this statement on the wall. In fact, you know, for us, we, we always talk, we're, we're not here to create a vision statement. We want to create a vision state of mind. And that happens by you know, thinking in terms of the right amount of, of vision information at the right amount of time, you mm-hmm. know, for the right team that's involved. So can I ask about this coming from like a kids ministry director? Because sure. I think sometimes we only assume the pastor's the only one with vision. Yeah. And so, I mean, I hear vision and it overwhelms me sometimes to think I've got to have it all figured out. Right. Um, so what would you give advice? I mean, because I, I know like for me, Sometimes when I had to, you know, we'd have to plan out the whole budget year. And some of that was just like, how do we get unchurched people in our in our church? Like that was the vision is like right. the vision for this year is to figure out two events that would get unchurched people. How to church. engage unchurched families. Yes. Like how right. would we get them to come to the door by what type of event? You know, that sort of thing. And so like how can this apply to other people besides just the pastor? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a bit of alignment. So I do think there is kind of – um an overarching for understanding. Sure. Yes. And so there's a little bit of a frustration, maybe a lot of a frustration for ministry leaders who are operating under a pastor who's not necessarily given that big picture. Because here's what's going to happen. As leaders, you're going to craft a vision, right? And as leaders, you know, attuned to the Holy Spirit working of God and kind of wanting to be um, a part of a body, then you're like, well, how do I, how do I make sure I'm not casting a vision that's different from where this leader wants to go? Well, and you're given a budget. And you're told yeah. to, you know, this is your yeah. your operating budget, yeah. and it's kind of like, but what what direction are we going yeah. if the pastor's not giving yeah. the vision? So, so here's what I would say: I would say that you can still craft that vision, like, hey, we want to engage, you know, X number of families this year. Now, let's think back about well, how do we practically what events do we know are already going to happen? You know, we have VBS, we have something that happens in the fall, we have some other things. How do we do that? But then I would say I'd lead up and say, hey, hey, pastor. Um, this is this is our team has gathered and we feel like this is where God is leading us. Lead downward too and say, okay, this is what we're going to do and this is what it's going to look like. And vision is both dreaming and doing. And I think that's critical. Mm-hmm. It, seem, it sounds to me like there's a five-step process here. I'm, I'm and you keep to coming every, back to no, that back process. To that. <laughs> because he I is. think if I'm listening to the show, I'm like, all right, take me down the process. Yeah, yeah, I, think I, need, yeah. I need time with the Lord yeah. and then I need – to get somebody to help me figure all this out. Then we need to get the right questions on the board. Yeah. Are we asking the right questions? And then we need to turn that those questions into a chronological approach. Here are the yeah. times we're going to set aside yeah. to execute this vision. And then step five for me is I've got to figure out a creative way to, to compellingly cast this vision yeah. Yeah. to a large group of people that are going to be asked in, to be a part of yeah. it. So yeah. that final step is like, how do I share this with the broader group yeah. in a way that they can tangibly get involved, right? I, what I am I missing? That. And you're right. But I also think that you, you have to keep in mind that vision dripping is better than vision soaking. And many times leaders go like, oh, wow, we're going to have this big rally. Oh, I'm going to yeah. douse you with the vision. And then two months later, I haven't said anything else about it. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I'm frustrated because it's not happening. 
versus kind of little by little dripping it into the culture, reminding people, hey, when we celebrate, you know, I love to, I love to cast vision for uh, leaders. What if your announcement time on Sunday was 180 seconds of vision casting, not three minutes of announcements? What if you could bring in the language of values and outcomes and kind of what we're expecting yeah. or the future and do those things? So I think for a leader, that step five is yes, but also think through who are those leaders, think concentric circles um, of communication, you know, cascading it out. Who are those immediate leaders that need to hear this first, right? Who? What's the next group, uh, you know, and what's the next group? Because you don't want to stand in front of the congregation and kind of cast this big vision and have your – your, your top key leaders, level leaders have not heard kinda, it. Yeah. Even if they're with it, they may do this and tilt their head like they're processing it. And and those who aren't in key leadership roles are going to look to the people that are and they're going to go, well, if they don't understand it, you know, why am I supposed to? But if you can have those leaders nodding their head. So I think a part of step five, five A is a concentric circle, you know, through your yeah. leadership teams. I love the things. distinction between yeah. vision dump and vision drip. Yeah. It's yeah. okay to do a vision dump as long as you have a plan to continue to drip that out. Yeah. And it is easy to just assume people are still with you, yeah. particularly in today's culture where you're preaching to a parade every Sunday and you got a different group of people. They may not have been there the Sunday you did yeah. the vision dump. That statement is so challenging. Vision dripping versus vision soaking. Yeah, explain what what he's saying there. Well, I heard a leader at a conference years ago talk about how vision leaks. So if everybody in the room has a little styrofoam cup and you fill up the cup with vision, there's a hole in the bottom. So by the time that group meets again, all that vision is already dripped out. It's already leaked out. So what Brian is saying is so important is like we talk about having these big events where we drop the vision on the church or we show the PowerPoint presentation or we reveal the slides or the images, but then we don't talk about it again for the next six or seven weeks and everyone's forgotten. So one of, the, one of the most difficult things about leadership is continuing to talk about the vision in ways that's different and fresh so it doesn't feel like it was just a one-time drop. Hmm. Uh, kind of like the, the whole Easter egg thing where the helicopters come in now and drop all the Easter eggs. Right. <laughs> I think pastors do that sometimes. We, like, we determine there's a Sunday where we're going to drop all the vision, and guess what? Half the people aren't there because on any given Sunday that's true. Mm-hmm. And then we assume they're going to watch the video and, or read the emails. Or read the emails. Which we all know is not going to happen. So I think Brian's spot on. Like to be a leader today, you got to say it, say it again, say it again. And and the idea is they're just hearing it when you're tired of saying it. I find that to be so true because you have to continue to preach on it. Yeah. So if you're out there and you're listening and you've cast a vision for the church, maybe you're, maybe you're in the middle of a vision campaign. Just remember that the people are going to continue to forget. You have to remind them and remind them what the vision is. So Brian, what about the small church pastor and how do they get their people involved in casting vision, especially if they don't perhaps have the means to use a group like Oxano? How can they use their people effectively? It's such an important question because Brian, as you know, most of Lifeway's business, we deal with small churches. Like we do deal with medium and large churches, but there's just so many churches that would classify, classify themselves as small. So we think about vision being for big churches. No, it's for small churches. So like, I'd love to hear your answer to this. I, you know what? I think there is there is a, an, an Ephesians four moment where we say, "Hey, listen, you know, how are you equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry?" And yeah, we may not think you know as as long range, or we may not think as broadly. I worked with a uh, a Southern Baptist church in southwestern Michigan, a church of about eighty, mm-hmm. um, and you know, we modified the tools because the tools work for us. We don't work for the tools. Um, the, we modified the tools for that group. I mean, the team had a sixteen year old. Uh, young man on it who skipped school for two days to sit in and do some of this planning. And that was, you know, personally very exciting. And, you know, as a, you know, the youth minister in me, you know, died hard. And so, you what know, a great experience. For yeah, him. it was a great experience yeah. of thinking. And, and he was bringing some life and energy that may not have had two. There were two physicians on the team that closed their practice for two days. Hmm. And, and and I think there's there's the challenge in those situations is a lot of times, sorry, the pastor may be afraid to ask to say, hey, listen, will you make a sacrifice and come and plan? And most of the time, the love for those people have for the church supersedes kind of the, you know, kind of the unwillingness to do those things. And so I think sometimes, Lindley, it's, it's a matter of just asking and just saying, and, and casting vision, saying, hey, listen, 
we have this important season coming up. We want to think deeply about where God has called us. Would you be willing to spend some time with us doing this? And and you'll be surprised. There are people who will, yeah. will do that. Why do you find it hard for pastors to ask? Uh, sometimes they already give the no in their head, okay. right? And they, they've built up the excuses of why. So, well, this person does this and they're busy with this. And, and also they don't really have a good understanding uh, of what we're trying to do. Right. And so to say, hey, listen, if we if we have this plan, that's part of what we do is come in and give them words to say, hey, we're going to build a plan that's going to help us see not just have a visionary idea, but the plan to execute the structure to, to work on that. So if you're out there and you realize you need some help forming a new vision yeah. for your church, reach out to Brian at Oxano. It's super easy. Go to their website, oxano.com, A-U-X-A-N-O.com, or just email us at president at lifeway.com, and I'll put you right in touch with them. I can tell you uh, he'll be a friend. Yeah. Brian, thanks for being our friend and being on the show today. My pleasure. It's been great to be here. The Glass House is a production of Lifeway. It's produced and edited by Angie Elkins, sound engineering by Dale Sandberg, Original music by Robert Elkins, photography by Rebecca McVeigh, and artwork by Heather Barzinski. We are your hosts, Ben and Lindley Mandrell. Thanks for listening.